Please welcome the Deputy Chief of the Detroit Police Department, U. Renee Hall. District 4 City Councilman for the City of Detroit, Andre Spivey. President and Chief Executive Officer of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron. Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Ideal Group, Frank Venegas Jr. And moderating the discussion will be Stephen Henderson, editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. Well, good morning. With uh, the recent events in places like Ferguson and Baltimore, I think there was no question that uh, with all of the uh, business and political leaders that we would have here uh, this week on Mackinac Island, that we needed to have a conversation, a, a frank conversation about race and the, ra the role that race continues to play uh, in opportunity uh, and the inequality gaps uh, that we see in society. And so the, the goal of this panel uh, is to bring a bunch of different perspectives together to talk about what, what, how far have we come, how far do we have to go, and what are some of the things, the very specific things, that the business community, that the political leadership in the state can do to address these things. And I think it's really important to note here, this is not uh, just a talking head session. This is not a think session. This is a, 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 an approach to doing something. We are going to sit here and talk about things, concrete things, that people can do to really start moving us past uh, the barriers we still have. I want to talk. I want to start with uh, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron, uh, the CEO of Kellogg, uh, because uh, I feel like her organization has really set the table for this uh, discussion in a in a very important way with a report uh, that was released this, uh, yesterday uh, about uh, the business case for racial equality here in Michigan. So let's start with you, Lejeune. Thanks, and I just happen to have a copy of the report. If anyone hasn't <laughs> received their copy, please. Find one. Um, I wanted to start out by just saying to you that uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is a business, um, and you know we're a business. We're an eight and a half billion dollar organization, and uh, we very much understand uh, the language and the nature of running uh, an effective business. And so when we uh, decided to launch this report which is a culmination of work we've done at the national level as well as beginning to localize our work in places. And with Michigan being a place that we have named as our priority place, which means we will be in Michigan uh, probably as long as the foundation exists, uh, we're very interested in producing a business case as well as just uh, what we believe are practical approaches to moving the state forward. And uh, I just want to point out that we don't produce this document as a thought piece. Uh, it comes out of decades of work that we've done at the Kellogg Foundation. And first, it was work that we did within the foundation. And so when I started at the foundation in 1987, which was 28 years ago, the foundation was not very diverse. Uh, and we had aspirations uh, to change the nation, yet we didn't have the perspectives internally to be able to achieve that goal. Since 1987, the Kellogg Foundation is now 40% people of color, and our board, and I want to particularly focus on the board, the board is 60% people of color. Uh, with that diversity and the work that we've been doing in this space, we realize that from a business perspective, there's an opportunity cost to doing nothing around the issue of equity, racial equity, and inequality. And this report talks about that business case. And what you'll see is you know, there is real money. As I think about uh, the revenue that we could uh, obtain in the state of Michigan by just reducing the earnings gap between uh, white and people of color, we would gain almost $30 billion of gross domestic product for the state of Michigan. And when you break that down, uh, we will have gotten over $900 million of tax revenues for the city of Detroit annually. So think about that. We maybe would never have had a, a bankrupt situation for the city of Detroit had we really 
fulfilled the promise and uh, the opportunities of all of the people in the city, and particularly people of color. So I'm interested in continuing to talk about this, but I believe you know not only is there a business case, uh, but there's more to learn from really looking at this deeply. Right. Frank, uh, I'd love for you to talk about uh, your work in Southwest Detroit, not just with the business uh, that, that you run, but with the school that you're very involved with and the connection that you've made between that business and opportunity for kids who otherwise probably would be left out. Well, it, let me back up just for a second. Uh, my business has been around for 37 years. I founded it and I moved to uh, Detroit in 1995 and I bought the old Cadillac Clark Street plant and at that time Southwest Detroit was in some of its worst shape unemployment 40 percent the gangs were running crazy prostitutes it was it was pretty tough uh, but one of the things that we had to do at Ideal is we're business so we had to have a business case and one of the things we needed is we needed employees but we also needed some peace in the neighborhood so we had the opportunity to sit down with four of the five major gang leaders in Detroit. And we sat down and we talked. And I asked them, I said, what do you all want to uh, create some peace in my neighborhood? And uh, it was amazing. Uh, four of the five automatically said we want jobs with medical, dental, and don't leave. And uh, we hired 80 of them and we put them together, rival gangs working with each other. And it's the business case. And like Lejeune said, it's got to be the business case and what, what goes on. And one of the original guys, who was one of the gang leaders, now operates one of my operations uh, in Southeast United States. He manages eight states, lives in Florida, he's got a great living, he's got three kids, two of them are going to college, and he takes care of his mother. But more importantly, it's the people that work in my plant and see what we do and what goes on. And gosh, I look at the population of the people that work for me, and it's all colors. And most importantly, since I'm in Southwest Detroit, so many of the people that work for me are from Southwest Detroit. Some of them started out as interns. Some of them started out just doing regular jobs, which is great because we have great benefits. But others have decided to go to college and become engineers. It's really incredible what goes on. And in our situation, in the late Eleanor decided she used to call me the focus hope that makes money. And it's so <laughs> Well, it really is the truth, because you have to have the money, you have to have the things, because we went into the schools, and we found out the schools were important. Um, we started a clubhouse in a neutral area where we, there's no gang activity, but we created a, a learning center and put a gym in there, and we removed tattoos, and, and now we're in the robotics in the biggest way in the world. And soon we're going to announce a major corporation that's going to follow 16 of my kids all the way through high school at Crystal Ray into being interns. So it's the importance of raising the level of the economy so that we're bridged the gap. Right. Uh, Councilman Spivey, you represent uh, an area of the city that has an incredible uh, set of challenges with, with, with opportunity, but you're also uh, a pastor uh, of a church uh, in an area of the city that, that faces uh, those same kinds of things. Talk to me about, from your perspective, what are the things that, that we need uh, to, to, to get over these sort of opportunity challenges uh, and, and how is that working? I think, Steve, one word for me is engagement. Um, I'm halfway through the report for the Kellogg Foundation. I know Frank and, and D.C. Hall here. Uh, and when I saw, going back to your initial comment, Stephen, the coverage of, of a Ferguson or Baltimore, and I said to myself, that cannot be Detroit. We cannot go back to 1967. And engagement is key for us. Uh, we don't have a, a large purse uh, as an elected official about what we can do to bring people together. Uh, we bring our communities, our faith-based organizations, our police department, our businesses to say uh, we can do better and we will do better. And I see the disparities every single day. Uh, I'm reading about it in the report, seeing the numbers, but I see it every day. 
of people who are unemployed or underemployed uh, and they're just, just trying to survive. And so how can we as policy uh, makers uh, make a difference? How can we connect with the business community to make a difference and make sure that people, and, and in my area, Stephen, uh, in my district in Detroit, I have million dollar homes and I have 48205, one of the most challenging zip codes and everything in between. So how can we uh, bring a cohesiveness to that area and know that, um, that we cannot have, uh, we, we, we can have it, but we must stop what could happen in Baltimore and have engagement so that when something does arise, we're already talking to police, already talking to business, already talking to faith-based community and our politicians. Uh, and, and I'm just happy that it's happening here on Mackinac Island uh, by the chamber, but I do hope that when we have the conversation here today, it, it develops feet and walks back down to Detroit so that we can have some action. So when we come back next year, we can see some things that have taken place. Right, right. Uh, Renee, the, uh, the, 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 the images from uh, Baltimore in particular, uh, I think were, were really powerful in the, in the way they, they sort of portrayed the tensions between that community and the police department uh, when, when the disturbances there happened. Tell me why that might not, might or might not be possible in Detroit. Um, one of the reasons why, and I won't say might not, I mean, never happen or might not be possible, but one of the things that uh, we're doing in the city of Detroit from the Detroit Police Department, uh, Chief Craig and uh, Mayor Duggan in two separate laboratories um, at the same time created neighborhood police officers and neighborhood district managers, um, which says that great minds think alike. They recognize that the community is the focus and that is the direction that we must stay in. That the police department, the city of Detroit as a whole is truly engaged as uh, the councilman stated, that we're engaged with our community. We have neighborhood police officers in and around every sector of the community. We're working with faith-based organizations, dealing with quality of life issues. Um, and also, in addition to the neighborhood piece, we are transparent as a police department because we recognize that um, to build trust, there must be a two-way street. So as a police department, when something goes on in our police department, uh, as we had a shooting by a, an ICE agent who's not Detroit, but he's law enforcement. Right, right. the same week as, uh, as the disturbances as in the Baltimore. As the disturbance in Baltimore. We have to be extremely transparent. We utilize the media for that. They are the uh, effective uh, tool that we use in our goal of transparency to make sure that we're letting the community know if we make a mistake, here's what we've done, here's what we're doing about it. Uh, we also look at the, the Fergusons and we say uh, race is important. We are an 82% African American city and we have to be reflected. They, and it has to be reflected in our police department. Our police department is reflective of our community. Um, so there's a, a, a plethora of things that go together to ensure that we don't become a Ferguson or a Baltimore. When we see that the, the protests started and they began in, in these various cities, our agency uh, under the, the leadership of our chief uh, we are in, insured to go out, talk to those organizers, let them know we support their right to assemble and we will help facilitate peaceful assembly. And we can't show up with riot helmets. We can't show up with dogs on the front line. We have to say we understand, we're here to support, and we, 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 we want to do this orderly. So those are the things that we've done and we continue to do. 48205 is one of our most problematic areas as uh, the councilman discussed. We have a ceasefire program that's in that respective area. We're talking about uh, the, 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 the issues that are in that area, the gangs that are uh, represented in that area. And not only from an enforcement side, there's an outreach support and a community services side that goes in, recognizes those gang members have to have something else to do, an opportunity for uh, jobs, employment, and, and just quality of life skills. And so those things are wrapped around from a holistic standpoint. Uh, and we have to be sort of a kinder, gentler police department in order to get these things done. Right. Uh, Frank, uh, you're a business owner, uh, much like uh, a lot of the folks who are in the audience here. Tell me where they start. Uh, if, if you are operating a business uh, in, in Detroit or the state of Michigan and you're concerned about uh, opportunity gaps, wh what are the things you can do? What are the, the sort of first steps you can take uh, to recognize the problem and then act in a way that, that mitigates it? 
God, you asked me a real hard question, and I <laughs> promised I wouldn't get controversial. <laughs> no, I want you to be controversial. Uh, you need to look at the whole situation, what it is and what it's like. Um, there's areas in Detroit, and to me, it'd be some of the questions that I'd be asking at this conference so that we can think about this to come back next year is, is that, you know, we're looking at downtown Detroit, and we're looking at the, the medical side of the campus and different ideas. Is what are we going to do for the rest of Detroit, and what are we going to do to make it better? Because we kind of did that in southwest Detroit, in Mexican town, because it reminds me a lot in 95 when I moved here, it was pretty crazy. And uh, th there wasn't that outreach out there between everybody, and everybody wasn't all friendly like sometimes we want to make it believe like it is. And sometimes we have to go and test, test ourselves a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'm an old tough guy, and uh, I, if I wasn't an old tough guy, I probably wouldn't have sat down with these guys. Because when they had the meeting, I didn't know where we were going to meet until 15 minutes before. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to get into, what was happening. Um, I looked at the neighborhoods and what it was like, and you know, how do you go up to the people that uh, are causing troubles in the town and tell them you can't do it? Um, uh, the police, I mean, the police were just absolutely incredible and so important in what we did and what goes on. But, it's been growing and continuing this relationship on what goes on, what happens. And, you know, to have a policeman go up and down Clark Street or Junction or maybe fill out a report near your property or just the presence of them, it really creates this bond where now we have another trust. We found that keeping an interaction with the gangs was just absolutely essential for us because there's lots of things that go on in the neighborhood that the police can't do. Uh, that the clergy and the churches can't do, and people like myself can't do, that the gang's got to take a look. And so you have to have that communication with the gangs and what you expect and what you see. Uh, the clergy, we found that the clergy were really, really wild because, because the clergy would come to us, and it was usually with a young man or a young lady that was already in trouble that maybe found through the police that we have a good kid here and we need to talk and help them helping someone that stumbles one time and helping them get back up. But the program is continuation. To me, I, I mean, I won a car in a car draw 37 years ago, a Cadillac, and I sold it and I started my business, and now my business is probably combined near 300 million. And what I've done personally and what other people have to do and look at it is I look at my private jet is the community. It's the schools, the churches. I mean, I got 74 kids that go to college through Ideal and what we do and what goes on. We have interns all over the place. It, it's taking a look at the whole big job. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be honest where you're starting. If you think something isn't right and you think it's better than what it is, most often it's not. But a lot of times the answer to the problem is really just in how we react and how we work as a team. Same question to you, Lejeune. Yeah, I'm listening to Frank, and this issue of disengagement, I think, is key. And, and it's not just a Michigan issue, it's a global issue. Uh, and as the trends uh, indicate, this youth bulge will be an issue for the country and the world to deal with. But particularly in Michigan, by 2040, uh, this youth population will be people of color. And today, those people are disengaged and, and, and not participating in this economic market. So what we've been trying to support uh, throughout the country, at the end of the day, is jobs. You know, I'm speaking from someone who got my first job at age 14. And at that time, jobs were available for young people. When I met with those young people in Ferguson, uh, and I want to know that I sat down and really talked to them, and what you see in the youth is leadership, a very courageous leadership, and uh, they're very articulate, and they do have demands. And when you actually listen to them, all they're asking for is a seat at the table, an opportunity to be successful, jobs, communication, dialogue, 
Uh, and so what we're trying to do at the Kellogg Foundation is really support the movement of engaging youth, youth leadership programs, but particularly just employing them. I encourage all business owners to hire one to five yeah. Internships. Youth. Internships are really key. You talked about it's that. It's very clear. You learn a work ethic. You learn a value stream. And, and what the employers learn is uh, by experiencing and becoming closer to people that you don't engage with every day, there's a learning and a growth there that helps their business grow as well. Yeah. So, you know, in the city of Detroit, we're working with the mayor. We believe in his program around around growing Detroit's uh, young talent. And the goal was 5,000 jobs this summer, and I think we've even exceeded that goal. But the bottom line is we need to engage our youth, we need to employ them, they are the future, and we must make sure that they're working for our economy. And the ask here uh, from the businesses is pretty minimal for something like that, right? right? Yeah, I mean, one or two internships. Uh, What's that cost? Could, can't cost uh, other than time, right? Uh, but there's a, re a return as well. There's a great return right. for the I, I can tell you how much it costs. It costs a lot of money. But I can tell you more importantly, it costs a lot of time. Yeah. But I also will tell you what you get back. You make a lot of money off it. It's incredible on what happens when you train these kids, okay? I, I have the, at Crystal Ray, it's called the School to Work, and we start in ninth grade. And it's pretty incredible on seeing what's happening when the kids go to school and go to work or have a summer job or an opportunity. Now my partner next to me to the right, it's really, really incredible on what Kellogg's done for us. And you talk about jobs, you talk about things that happen, you talk about combining opportunities. And we had a discussion last night that I found real interesting. And it was, it was just not with Lejeune, it was with two other highly respected that I feel proud to stand and, and talk with. And we talked about, and uh, I happen to be Mexican in background. My, my grandpa come here in 1917 shagging the $5 a day job that Henry Ford offered. So we've had a long time in Corktown and it's really done a lot of stuff. But when we have the opportunity to create programs where we have private companies like myself being and showing interest with companies like the Kellogg Foundation and putting the two together saying, hey, guess what? Maybe there's something we can do together. But the most important thing is, is they're, they deal with people all over the United States and the world. If they bring back a program, say, hey, guess what? We have a program with an MBE that's from Detroit, and they're out helping and teaching kids, teaching the missions that we are. All of a sudden, you have something that you can show to others, because there's no way that any one of us are going to make the change. It, it really has to be everybody. Stephen, I think we have to also look at another demographic. We, I support the young people employing them, but we have a demographic from 18 to 40, uh, particularly African-American men. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to bridge the racial gap, the economic gap, the social gap, we can't leave that you group have to out. That we have first. to include them. And so speaking to an audience of business leaders here on Mackinac Island, um, how can we engage not just hiring young people, but hiring uh, that age group 18 to 40 and infusing capital into existing businesses in the neighborhoods in the city of Detroit? I'm, I'm a believer downtown and midtown will be fine, but many of the products that, that, that are bought by businesses here, they are peripheral businesses in districts one through seven. Yes. Uh, and and, and yes, let's use them as a, as a supplier or, uh, or, or vendor so that we can infuse capital throughout our community. And, and the reality is, if, if we don't support that demographic, we're going to be turning to D.C. Hall to pick them up and arrest them. And, and the cycle of Detroit's image will continue to uh, be a negative one. But I think this, this group here can be the catalyst to say, when we go back, how can we infuse social and capital investment into Detroit? Uh, the, and the governor has a program of community, community ventures. And, and that program has said, uh, enough training. We have so many dollars for training already. How can we now make sure there's a job ready, Waiting not just for, for young people, right. but for, totally. for yeah. adults? who are trying to just survive, and some who do not want to go back into the correction system, some want to make sure they have an environment for their family to live, have a good quality of life, because the truth of the matter is, if we don't employ those people, 
our young people are living in those kind of environments, and we are perpetuating that same negative environment of underemployment, uh, lack of employment, lack of education. And so I would hope that we will leave here today to hopefully bridge those gaps. Uh, and from a business case, there's money to be made, there are lives to be saved, and there's communities that can be built if we come together. Well, let me ask you how important uh, re rethinking the way we deal with people returning from the correction system into Detroit is in that equation. A lot of businesses, you know, yes. they have that little box, right? Check it. Uh, are you a convicted felon? And that disqualifies you. Is right. that something we really need to... And in the city of Detroit, we, we approved the orders, Ken Cockrell, some years ago. Uh, we took it off our application in the city of Detroit. Right. And we've asked our vendors to take it off as well. And a colleague of mine, uh, we had a returning citizen task force, but it got kind of lost with our bankruptcy issues. Uh, and we had it going. But um, I think it's very important that before we, we come out of the system, Stephen, that we go in to prepare them to come back. Where do I live? How do I receive an ID? How do I find employment? And, and, and people like Frank, who've hired people, uh, returning citizens and, and programs. Yeah. Frank, how do you handle that? In it your can business? work. Uh, well, we have 500 employees. I, 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 I'm kind of in the agreement. I don't look at the people that I have much more than I might look at them as an ex-felon or something like that, only for about a couple days or when they need some help. I, I, I can't see them. I can't tell them. I, I don't know. All I know is I can read the numbers. And just like we talked about the 20 to 40 years old, you know, in Detroit, I mean, unemployment rate is in areas up to 40 percent. If you are a person that has been in prison and that lives in that 20 to 40 crowd inside of Detroit, your unemployment rate is, could be 80 percent. But, you know, the wild thing that I found is when I bring this up about looking at films and looking what's going on, Really, the, the demographics have changed because most of us know someone in our family, might be a cousin, could be a brother, could be someone that has been incarcerated for something. And you see the problems that go on with them, but we also see the issue that can help them most, and it's an opportunity, and it's a job. It's just like the one guy that I was telling you that was the gang leader that runs my, one of my operations in Florida. When he first started with me, he started out as a laborer. He's about a six foot four, tall Puerto Rican, strong, and he was just absolutely a horrible laborer, okay? <laughs> well, he come to us, and we like working with him because he, he spent seven years in prison and just got out and his boy was eight, and he says, I wanna go to mechanic school. So we said, all right, so we sent him this little mechanic school. I'm gonna tell you what, he was a horrible mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> well, my brother was looking at him and we have a real fast growing company. And my brother looked at him, brought him into the office. And whenever you have guys that have been in trouble in the past, they get scared. Well, it was crazy. He was scared, he was nervous. My brother looked at him and says, I'm gonna give you a different job. And he gets back, what do you mean change? You know, everyone's scared of that. He says, you're gonna go into sales. The guy pushed back in the seat and he says, I don't know anything about sales. My brother looked at him immediately. He says, you know how to sell, you know how to distribute, you know how to organize. <laughs> you had a hell of a business, so why can't you be a salesperson? <laughs> and like I said, today he runs seven that. states for me and, and he's taking care of things. So again, it, 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 it's got, it didn't happen overnight. Nothing's gonna happen overnight, yeah. but it's how do you start? Right, yeah. right. Uh, we, Chief, yeah, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I was going to ask you, uh, how important is it, uh, you know, so often you coming into contact with uh, the, the people that we're talking about who are left out once they have done something uh, wrong and once they need to, to be dealt with by law enforcement. What's the, what's the role of, of DPD, though, in making that contact before to prevent uh, to prevent them from doing those things. Uh, th those are the things that we have been engaging in in these last couple uh, years, uh, just currently looking at who our offenders are. It is it's so important for us to be proactive in that process. And one of the things that I actually spoke to the councilman about is a, a program that we wanted to do with our returning citizens. We cannot arrest our way out mm -hmm. of the issues that are in and surrounding the city of Detroit. Right. So we know that these individuals who are returning to our city have to have um, employment, they have to have education. So we have to create th 
those windows. We're looking at starting a mentoring program through the police department with the, the, the city council in order to identify those businesses who have jobs available. It is so important because if they disengage, they must feed their families. Mm -hmm. So if they have to feed their families, they're going to do whatever is whatever necessary, is. Okay. Uh, which then brings them to us. And that is not our goal, is to lock up all of the African-American men throughout our city. We need to provide an opportunity for them to, to, to migrate back into uh, our quality society. And these are the ways that we do that through education, through uh, uh, employment, through Kellogg, through the ideal group. So we have to, from a law enforcement standpoint, wrap our arms around this, treat it as a holistic approach, and work with them. Uh, it can't just be enforcement because that has not worked in the past and it yeah. will not work in the future. Yeah. Uh, Lejeune, what are the things that are holding us back? I mean, you, you've talked about how, <clears throat> uh, especially in your report, it's important to speak the language mm -hmm. of business mm -hmm. in this conversation. In other words, uh, to, to, to talk to them, at, 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 meet them at their level, to bring them along on this issue. What, what, what's in the way uh, of us doing that? Well, language is key, and, and what we're learning is uh, communication is even more important. And I think uh, what will take us forward is developing a space where we can actually dialogue uh, very intentionally and understand what's happening and then create the way forward. Uh, what we do at the Kellogg Foundation at the national level, we have a convening, and it's called America Healing where we bring people together of various uh, backgrounds, ethnicities, and that's very intentional that it must be all ethnicities and backgrounds. But we dialogue, and uh, it's a very intentional strategic approach because this work is not just the head work, so we know we can do a business case and cognitively it makes sense, but there's a heart piece to it. And our America Healing Strategy is connecting the head and the heart. And what's holding us back is creating that space for that dialogue and awareness. And that's what we are now wanting to bring to the local level from the national level. So over the next year, we're really looking at working with our grantees right here in Michigan and the city of Detroit to have some of these local healing opportunities, healing circles. And what we've seen is people learn a great deal from others, as they call them, people that they don't normally engage with, and it's been transformational. And I think that space is necessary to make progress moving forward. Yeah. Uh, how important is it, and this is to, to everybody, how important is it to theme this as a racial problem, to say this is about race? Uh, a lot of times when we, you, you say that word, uh, you start that conversation, people coil up, right? Uh, or they push you back and say, well, you know, maybe it's about economics or maybe it's about those things. H how do you bridge that gap to make people comfortable uh, talking about it in racial terms and talking about it in terms of solutions? I think you look at it, you don't have to label it race, it is race. When you look mm -hmm. at what's going on throughout the city of Detroit, you see that we are locking up uh, African-American males by far and large, uh, larger than in our Caucasian Anybody counterparts. Else. Anybody else. Uh, when we look at the unemployment rate and the poverty rate, it is centered around the African American community. So we don't have to label it race. It is race if you just open the book and look at it. So um, we need to get comfortable with the facts. And I think that that's what we should focus on, not that it's, it is race, but the facts say that it's race, not that we're labeling it that. Council. I, 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 I see it every day, uh, Stephen. Um, but I'll say this, um, we know that Detroit is predominantly an African-American city, and, and I think the conversation has to go on both sides, that, that those in the African-American community, uh, we don't want them to come back or them to come to the city of Detroit. And those who are moving into Detroit, particularly <laughs> Caucasian-Americans, um, you know, I'm moving just one area of town. Uh, we are still a very polarized uh, city and a polarized region, and until we, we face that reality, and see that we all must come together, like your heartfelt my comment, Lejeune, uh, come together uh, for a region. Uh, when, we, when we put all the numbers together, Stephen, we are Detroit, southeastern Michigan, the state of Michigan, and we are one of 50 states. And for me, making sure that Michigan moves forward 
And if Michigan moves forward, Detroit will move forward. But we must, we must face reality. There are certain barriers that we still have as African Americans or Hispanic Americans uh, in, in the city of Detroit. And I think this can be the catalyst to break those barriers down, this group right here. Uh, economics runs uh, progress. And until we have gainful employed uh, citizens, until we have a, uh, a viable educational system so they can be gainfully employed, we won't, have, we won't break down any barriers. But economics runs this. We, we say black and white like these sheaves on the back of these sheet of chairs here, black and white, but it's green. Economics will move the city forward to keep people, and we can, we can I want to run D.C. Hall out of a job, so we don't have to <laughs> okay. block up people, uh, but economics will run it, and, and the numbers are there from the, from the Kellogg report, but it has to start as Frank said, it has to start somewhere, and stop talking about it, but actually, actually doing something when we leave here from Mackinac Island. Is there a role, or is there a specific role that the clergy community can be, can be playing with the business community to do this? The church or the faith-based organizations is the only institution that multiplies and doesn't decrease. Schools close, <laughs> businesses close, neighborhoods run down, but in Detroit particularly, you will never see a church close in Detroit. They open almost every, every week. Uh, those are my colleagues, so I, I can talk about them. Um, but but we, have, we have churches, plethora of churches throughout the city of Detroit. We have to take a role. We have to take a role and, and, not, and, and, and not, not worry about who's in charge, Stephen, but take a role that police can't do it alone, business, uh, philanthropy, philanthropy community, philanthropy community. We can do it, we have to do it together because at one point in time, the clergy was the leading figure in the community and so often we are so concerned about our own uh, chiefdoms that we are not concerned what happens outside our, our four walls, but it, it has to take, we have to do better, Steve, and I'll be the first one to say we have to do better in order and, to and this process. And I'm gonna push that further. How many of the businesses at a conference like this uh, do you see coming to the neighborhood where your church is to, to, to start that outreach? How, how often uh, are they reaching out to you? I think the, the problem, very few, Stephen, ask your question, and the challenge is, uh, we have to reach out to the business community as well. Not when we want something, but reach out to have dialogue and engagement. And I will say that in our district, uh, for uh, a number, uh, we, have, we have three major businesses in, in our district, PVS Chemicals, Chrysler Corporation, right. uh, and the back half of Better Made. Right. Uh, but we have a number of small to medium-sized businesses who are contributing to the community, they give and we ask, and they're employing returning citizens and those young people, you have to go out and ask. And, and uh, you know, not to get too religious, there is, there is a scripture, uh, <laughs> ask and you shall seek and you shall find, not the door shall be open, ask and you shall receive. We have, we have to go out and do it. And, and it can start right here. And uh, so my, my charge to go back now, uh, Stephen, I came to hopefully be a, a, a voice of, of, of encouragement, but for me, I've been encouraged being on the panel to go back to my clergy colleagues and my council colleagues who are here today and work with Raiden Hall as we go back to, to work on returning citizens. Work has to be done. And we all here on the panel and in the, in the audience here, we are all leaders in the state of Michigan. And if we are called leaders, we must be about leading uh, to make some things happen uh, for everyone. And everyone can, be, can, be, can benefit. Business, faith-based, city, clergy, education, everyone. Uh, because I want my two children to go off to college. They, they have to go out of Michigan. They need to get away from Michigan and then come back to do something, particularly in the city of Detroit. But I understand, Stephen, Every child has the same opportunity my children have. So I have to look out for those who are outside of my household as well. Yeah, well, Jim. So on your question of race, um, I just want to be clear. Uh, race is a construct. Mm -hmm. It was created right. by man. Uh, it's a belief in human hierarchy based on pigmentation. Yes. As opposed to a belief in one humanity. So just as race was created, it isn't an adjective. We can talk about it not as an adjective, not racism, but racialized structures right. and racialized uh, systems are important to address. Because if we don't, we will recreate those same systems. And what we're learning is race is not an intentional action in all cases. Racism is not an intentional action. Right. We're all it's unconsciously biased. Sure. Yeah. We're all unconsciously biased by our own backgrounds and our uh, 
systems that we've grown up and, and, and been a part of. So what we have to do and what our work is about is bringing a level of consciousness to what we do by rote, bringing data and knowledge to that decision making point and real relationships and trust so that we can make those decisions very differently than we've made in the past. Yeah. And so you have to talk about the root cause of what has gotten us to this place, but it's also a way forward. Yeah. Right? So I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody said a lot about the, the race side, and, 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 that's, and that's good, but uh, I mean, I'm Mexican in background, and a lot of times when we look at Detroit, we look at Detroit being black, and then you, the Hispanics too. I look at Detroit as being Detroit. I look at what goes on in businesses when I do. I don't look at myself as being a Hispanic business. I got 50 products, I got 100 patents, I got construction business, I got all sorts of different things, and I compete against anybody and everybody. But since this is a business conference, where I really implore people to look at is, and I'm a big person on money because I know that I went bankrupt in 1986. It was pretty incredible and pretty crazy, and I had no money, no credit rating, no nothing. And I know that we just come out of that situation here with the city of Detroit, and I do look at you all that are business leaders, okay? Because tons of leaders up here. I mean, gosh, I sit in this chair and big bosses <laughs> before me, and it's great. But, you know, when you're looking about expanding your business and looking at something, uh, Try and not look at the tax credits or ask the city, okay, what kind of money are you going to give back to me or what can you not charge me for taxes over here because they need the tax money. They need the revenue. I think you need to take a look at why are we in Detroit and why are we doing business in Detroit. And the real truth of the matter is, I do a lot of stuff in California, and we heard some inventors and some crazy things. It's, it's, nuts, it's nuts out there. When you go out there and talk to the guys at Google and, and Microsoft and everything like that, they talk about doing things, but then they say, we got to build it, and we should be the builders, and we could be the builders. And we need to expand the business. And the most important thing is we're talking about all these unemployed people and all these opportunities and what goes on and how we build. And everybody in the country and different parts of the world know that we can build things. We got the engineers. We have to do it. But what we need to do is just take a little moratorium, especially businesses, and take a look at what can we put in rather than what are we going to get out. And I can guarantee you this. With that, you'll make a lot of money. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've only got a minute left. Uh, what, what I would love to, to, to make clear is we have a minute left in this conversation today. Mm -hmm. We don't have a minute left uh, in the conversation that we have to have when we go home. Uh, we don't have a minute left in the conversation that we are going to continue next year when we come up here uh, on the island, and hopefully we will be able to say we have some victories as well. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.